Good evening, everybody, or good morning from where I currently sit in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, my name is Chris Halliday. I'm a Salvation Army officer, and part of the team behind included the group of people uh, who came together last year with the intention of creating opportunities for connection and conversation that lead towards inclusion in the Salvation Army. We'd really love to welcome you to today's webinar. Uh, before we begin, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge uh, the traditional custodians of the land where I'm sitting. As I said, I'm in Melbourne, Australia. And here uh, are and always have been the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the East Kulin Nation. Uh, those people, along with other Aboriginal groups around this incredibly large continent, have been the custodians and the carers of these lands for around 60,000 years. They are indeed the world's oldest surviving civilization. And as I sit on their lands, I wish to pay my respects to their elders of the past and to the elders of the present. Now, as we begin this uh, webinar, we're so uh, appreciative that you've taken the time out to come and be a part of these conversations. This is the first in a series of webinars, which we're going to be uh, holding this year. Now, they're slightly different than our larger included 2020 event last year. Whereas that gave us an opportunity to, uh, to connect with a range of different topics and a range of different people over the course of two weekends. In these shorter webinars, we're gonna be focusing a little, deep diving, if you will, with one particular focus, allowing one guest to really give us uh, a, a large amount of information uh, from their area of specialty or of interest. Something we picked up from the feedback from the event last year was that there is a deep desire within the Salvation Army for conversation. There is a deep desire for resourcing and equipping for content that will allow people connected with the Salvation Army to wrestle with these ideas, to really work through what it means for us to be truly welcoming, truly affirming and truly inclusive as a church. So we hope that this series of webinars will help a little in that regard. And it's worth mentioning that this uh, series of webinars, which we'll be, we'll be having through this year, will lead us to another larger event, the same as we had last year, included 2021, which will be coming uh, around November this year. Today, our keynote speaker is Reverend Dr. Arno Steen Andresen. And we're so very thankful that he's taken the time out to speak from his wealth of experience and knowledge. Currently, the co-president of the European Forum for LGBT Christian Groups. We'll be spending quite a bit of time with Arno as well uh, to, to, to learn from his experience and also hear from some of his own personal story. There'll be a, a, an ample time for Q&A session. And then if you're looking for more information or to work through this a little bit more, we're going to have an after meeting conversation uh, where those who uh, would like to or need to can, can move away. And then those who wish to stick around can, uh, can delve in a little bit more and work through some of these issues together. One of the foundational elements of everything we do as an included team is to raise the voices of those within the Salvation Army who are themselves uh, identify uh, as gender or sexuality diverse. And coming up shortly, we're going to be starting off this particular session with Spencer Viney a young trans man from Australia who will be sharing some of his experiences. First though, we'll take a moment to pray, to ground ourselves. It's worth mentioning that on this, the fourth Sunday of uh, Lent, the uh, scripture passages uh, include uh, John chapter three, verses 14 to 21. There's something really significant and important for those of us who are here and a part of this conversation today. We see this very foundational message, a message we all know very well, that God so loved the world 
that he sent his only son into the world so that whoever believes has eternal life. Or as we might say in the Salvation Army, whosoever believes is welcome. Whosoever believes has full life. We read in this passage that Jesus came not to condemn the world, but he came as the light into the world. There is not condemnation. We read that all who live with Jesus have come into the light with him. And I'd suggest that all who live with Jesus have the light within them. Let's hold on to this very special truth as we listen to the stories, as we learn from the experiences, and as we move forward as a group of people connected with the Salvation Army, doing everything we can to make sure that the whosoever are fully welcomed, fully affirmed, and fully included. As we pray, let's take a moment to just pause. Wherever you are in the world, aware that there is much going on around each of us, let's just stop. The Holy Spirit is all around us. We are able to become aware of the Spirit's presence. God, who is the creator of all things, binds us and unites us across the world. He has brought us all to this point and he pulls us forward together. And Jesus Christ, the light of the world, is with us. Take a moment wherever you are to imagine and to picture that Jesus is sitting right there with you as we move through this conversation today. Lord Jesus, we love you. We seek to be more like you. We desire so deeply that more people can come to know your truth, your heart, your love, and your light. Lord, we seek that more people would understand that they are welcome at the table. We seek to be ambassadors of your love. We seek to be champions of those who are feeling that they're not welcome or included in your kingdom. We seek to hear your voice today. Lord, would you guide us by your Holy Spirit with open ears and open hearts and open minds? Would you bless us as we move through this morning and then as we move on back out into the world with all that we've known? We thank you for all that you are. We thank you for your light. We thank you for your love. And we thank you for your embrace of the whosoever. Guide us this morning, Jesus. Amen. And now, also from down here in Australia, Major Genevieve Peterson having a conversation with Spencer Viney. Hello, everybody. My name is Genevieve Peterson. I'm an officer in the Australia Territory, and it is my absolute privilege to be here today with Spencer. Welcome, Spencer. Hi, thank you. It's my pleasure. Um, do you want to start by telling us a bit about yourself? Sure. So I'm Spencer. I'm a queer trans man from Melbourne. I've been a part of the Salvation Army since I was born. Uh, both of my parents are Salvation Army officers. Um, yeah, I'm a creative person and I love uh, yeah the creative industry, I'm trying to get into it at the moment. And I would love to uh, have that as a, as a part of my ministry. So, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Sounds amazing. Okay, so we're going to have a bit of a conversation about your experience and I wonder if it's okay if I ask you, when did you first start to notice that you were maybe experiencing life differently to maybe how other people were your age? Yeah, so I would say I was probably five or six, maybe seven, when I started to realise that I felt like something was off with being seen as female being treated as, as female, especially in a school setting or, you know, at church as well. Um, 
being like split into boys and girls like that just didn't feel right for me I knew that I had, was supposed to be on the other side yeah. but I didn't really know what that meant as a child I never really heard of the word transgender you know through my childhood so I was just very confused about that and with you know bullying at school as unfortunate you know it happens a lot um I didn't want to give them another reason to to bully me so I was really ashamed of these feelings so I basically just shoved them down as deep as I could till I just basically blocked it out for most of my life yeah so. that must have been can I just say that must have been really hard because as a kid yeah. life is hard enough but but yeah. to have all those extra pressures on you would have been um, really confusing was there anyone who even back then when you were sort of five six seven years old that said anything or that you could have talked to or did you have the language for that not really I think it was a mixture of yeah not having the language and no one really noticing anything yeah. that was going on because I, I hit it so well I didn't let anyone know yeah what I was feeling about that yeah wow okay all right so that's that's already a really great lesson for us i think when we're working with even little kids that we can start mm. to help them find the language for things um mm. that that's, that might be a really helpful thing that we could do for for kids who are i don't know just exploring or, or trying to work out life for themselves yeah all right thanks for that that's good um all right so then you grew up a little bit more did things sort of emerge or 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 become real for you a bit more as you grew? I think as a teenager, these feelings did try to come back up. And I was like, no, we're not, we're not dealing with this. I'm just gonna deny it yep. <laughs> for as long as I can. Yeah, let's see how um, that works with life. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Um, yes, yeah, so that obviously didn't work. <laughs> but during that time, you know, those conversations come up at church, at youth group about, you know, relationships, LGBT community, uh, where we stand as a church. And I had friends who obviously, you know, would disagree with that. And that was really hard because I knew that I was different and that kind of created conflict within myself of where am I supposed to stand on this mm -hmm. when I know that I'm going to end up on the other side, you know, with the LGBT community. So that was quite difficult as well to to know where am I in this yeah did some of those things help you explore those feelings more or, or start the conversation even within yourself like did it bring some of those things up in a positive way or was it just all nope this is unsafe and unhelpful yeah I think at, at the beginning it was more unsafe but I think as I grew a bit then it was like okay this is going to bring up everything that needs to come out basically yeah yeah um okay so i imagine that there were some people who were nicer and safer than others at what age did you start to find people that that were safe to speak to and to have these conversations with uh i would say 16 17 um especially when i moved to bendigo in 2015 I started going to a house church run by a couple who are a part of the Salvation Army and more than half of the young people there were a part of the LGBT community. Wow. So that's yeah, so unreal. that was uh, a really eye-opening place to be in where you can just come and just be and you're going to be loved on and accepted for who you are. That must have made a huge difference. Yeah, definitely. Was there something specific about that community that, that really made you feel like it was a safe space? Something they did or was it just a miracle? I think with it being a church setting where queer people weren't just pushed to the side, where they were actually a part of the conversation and they were allowed to be a part of it and they were told that, you know, they're loved by God the way that they are. I think that was a really important step for me uh, to be able to accept who I am. Yeah. So even just, it's not just that it was any support group, like it was important to you that it was a church support group or, mm. or like a, a church of faith community. Yeah. Yeah. yeah wow. Definitely. That's a really helpful thing for us 
I think, to learn as well. Um, so you're part of that and you're feeling like um, it's a safe space. Was there anything, I, oh, okay, just tell me what happened next in the journey. So you're 16, 17 at this point. What happened yeah. after that? So after I finished year 12, I went to university like straight away. Um, so that would have been 2016. And it was during this year, you know, bullying at school obviously stopped because I wasn't there anymore. Um, and so it was like my brain was finally like, okay, we're safe. Let's actually actually bring these feelings back up and actually deal with them finally. And yeah, so I was finally able to discover what that meant for me. I realised I had gender dysphoria and that, yeah, I was transgender. And having that house church was a really big help you know, because I already had support mm. and then that led to being able to medically transition uh, very smoothly because I knew that I was going to have support no matter what I decided to do with my body. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, I mean, well, thank God for that little support group, that faith yeah. community that's made a yeah. huge difference. Um, can you tell me what would have... Um, helped along the way do you have any advice maybe for faith communities but maybe just for people in general i mean i'm hearing some themes of um school was not necessarily a good good space for you and a faith community was really important um have you got any advice for people who are trying to be advocates um i think within a church setting it's really important to have those spaces available for queer people where they can just come and be and still learn about God, but actually be a part of the conversation. Yeah. Because yeah, you see a lot where, you know, they're welcome, but they're not really allowed to be a part of it. And I think that's a really important step uh, for us to move forward as a community together. Yeah. Cause it's so interesting, isn't it? Like people, I guess my question to you would be, have people tried to make you be different or, or you know, have you felt, um, I guess, Christians trying to tell you that God got it wrong or that somehow you need to change before you can be accepted? Mm -hmm. Have you felt that come through? I, I mean, thankfully it wasn't much for me. I know it's a lot worse for some other people. Um, but I did have a couple of people come into the house church and, you know, tell me I need to be cured um, and that I need the love of God uh, to stop sinning, which just doesn't make sense because I already have the love of God. So, yeah, that was quite hurtful that they came into my safe space and turned it into something that wasn't safe for me um, so you've got someone here who's saying, I love God and I want to be part of this faith community. Mm. Um, and you are loved and accepted just as for who you are. It's just such a, that's such a great thing. Okay. Mm. All right. So um, any parting words for us? What is it as a Salvation Army movement? Um, do you have hope for us? I mean, you're part of us. Yeah, I, I would say I do. I think we're starting to move in the right direction. And I know that it's taking time, but I think we will eventually get to the point where um, like LGBT people will actually be leading this conversation because that's what we need. We're not going to get anywhere if they're not actually a part of moving forward. Yeah, that is... Thank you for that as well, because of course that makes sense. I mean, yeah. who, who are any of us to say, well, you should think this and you need this. Mm. Yes, absolutely. And um, that, that sense in which we're as a community together, blended together um, as one big dysfunctional family that God's created us to be. <laughs> Let's embrace that. Um, well, <laughs> I just want to say, you know, two things. First of all, you know, just, I'm so sorry. Um, for any experience that you've had that's been negative because seeing you here today is just such a joy um, because it's so evident that
that God's in your life and that mm. God has a special plan and purpose for your life and that that plan is perfect just as God designed it to be. Um, yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. And um, I look forward to seeing your life unfold. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Bye. See ya. Thank you, Genevieve, Ock, uh, uh, and, and Spencer. What a, what, a, what a great interview. And uh, it's just great to hear stories um, because stories really teach us something that other ways of learning simply don't. Um, uh, so thank you for that. My name's Mark Cottrell and uh, I'm a Salvation Army officer in Sweden and it's a deep joy to be able to share with you tonight. Uh, we've got a, a great night ahead of us. Um, but first of all, if you haven't uh, been to any of the included uh, gatherings or on the Facebook page, I hope by now that, uh, and certainly after that interview, you will have realized that we love stories um, and uh, we, we, we're committed to, to making space for people to share their experiences and their stories. After all, you, you can't do uh, good theology detached from people's lives and from people's stories. You can't do church detached from people's uh, lives and people's stories. And you can't do Jesus detached from people's stories and people's lives. So we're committed to doing that. And we, we invite you to share your stories with us, get in touch with us. Um, it's one of the most important ways to learn. Um, and, uh, and that's, that, that's really important, but we're also committed to other ways of learning. We, we want to um, embrace the opportunity that we have now and for the, the webinars that are gonna be coming in the next few uh, months um, to, to create a space where we, we have content, uh, knowledge, if you like, uh, more of a classroom feel perhaps, uh, an opportunity to wrestle with some of the, the big ideas and the big uh, challenges that are in our culture, in our organizations, in the structures, uh, and that we face in our local communities uh, with regards to this question. Um, so that's what we're going to be doing now, actually. We're, we're going to have a time of uh, uh, allow, b giving the platform to Arno Steen Andreasen, Dr. Reverend Arno Steen Andreasen. Um, uh, we're, we're, essentially, what we're doing is we're inviting someone who has perhaps gone a little bit further in their wrestling with some of these questions, someone who's perhaps uh, dug a little bit deeper. And we want this to be exposed to everybody. We don't think these questions are just for a few at the top, uh, uh, for a certain few. We think um, this, this is a conversation for everybody at every level, for the margins uh, and for those on the edge, as well as everybody in the center. So um, I'm gonna welcome Arno, and we're gonna have about 20 minutes of teaching from Arno. Our theme for the session is, where do we go from here? what is the state of uh, Christianity and uh, how can we move forward in a polarized time in history? Sounds interesting? I think it does. Uh, already now, before I invite Arno just to jump in, uh, we have the chat function, which is operational. So even if you've got questions before Arno's talked, don't be shy, you can write them in the chat. Uh, and as Arno's talking you can already be uh, typing in your questions we'll do our best to collect them and uh, we'll pose them to Arno a little bit later so here we go welcome Arno take it away thank you so much well uh, thank you for the invitation and uh, it's just really good to uh, to be here and to to share with you um let me just give you a little bit of who I am let me tell you but um well, I work for Salvation Army, I'm a civilian, and I have worked for Salvation Army in Copenhagen for the last four years, where I work with uh, migrants, uh, especially the homeless. Um, but otherwise, I, um, as Mark mentioned, I am the co-president of the European Forum for LGBT Christian Groups, which is an umbrella organization for groups that are Orthodox, Catholic, or Protestant um, in more than 20 different countries of Europe. And we want to kind of push the whole thing of how to see change in church and in society. Um, 
but also I, I, I have been a pastor for more than 20 years. And when, one of the things we maybe can discuss a bit of the also the pain of losing your ministry. So when I came out five years ago, I lost my international ministry. I was um, the overseer of a small international movement of churches, uh, of church plants and social action ministries. And within 48 hours, I lost everything. And maybe we can talk a bit about things like that. Um, I'm also a psychotherapist of background. And therefore, if you're interested in also looking at what effect does it have on people in our churches when we keep on talking about them being ab abomination or that they go to hell or conversion therapy where we're trying to pray the gay away, we can also talk about things like that. Um, I was married for 30 years to a woman um, until I divorced five years ago, and I have two adult children as well. So I've also lived through that whole change, and I've been through conversion therapy over many, many years. So uh, that's just kind of some of my background, and maybe we can kind of uh, look at what does it mean? What's the pastoral effects of the kind of, of church that we are in Salvation Army and other places when we're not inclusive because it actually has incredible impact on people's lives. Um, I've written three books. Uh, the latest one is Desiring God, Meditations for the Gay Man and Other Edgy People. And that is really part of my own healing project. I was um, trying to mirror my life uh, in different Bible texts, trying to find healing, trying to get over trauma, trying to cope with what I've heard and experienced through church and um, I have put a couple of chapters into a pdf but we were trying to upload it into the chat here but it was not possible so maybe we can send it to you via email or in another way if you're interested in just trying to see both the inclusive heart of God but also uh, some of the healing part of God because I did not get I, I did not pray the gay away even though I tried for many years but I got healed from being straight acting. And uh, now I can be myself. See, I, I believe that we are in a time of we, a bit like stealing the title of uh, John of the Cross and John of the Cross, where you talked about the dark night of the soul, you know, those times of wrestling in our lives. But I actually do believe that we are in the dark night of the church because there's so many things that is just not really shifting in church life over these years. Uh, my experience is that I, I was a church planter in the UK for quite a few years. I'm from Denmark. I work with students also from Africa and Asia and was part of planting churches there as well. So this is kind of where I've got my, my, my understanding from. But it looked like that we've tried so many things through missions. We applied to try, pl plant churches, have fluid churches, inclusive churches, fresh expression churches. We've had, uh, you know, taking the whole nation for Christ. And if you look at it over the last 30 years or so, church is still declining. So there's something about this whole thing where church is just not really connecting but also we are in this losing battle, I feel, that where therefore we end up, uh, that we kind of go for tradition instead of renewal because we, we hold on to the tradition because we know what that means. And we are so afraid of losing our, our kind of uh, our heart and who we are. And, but the problem is we're losing who we are because we hold on to tra 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 uh, tradition instead of the DNA of what, what are we all about. Or we see that the whole thing we're afraid of, of, of discussing also inclusion because all these immoral gays, you know, they, they, then everything will go, you know, and if, if we allow gay people to really live out their gay, gayness, if they're kind of practicing homosexuals, then your morals will go down in church. So it's the kind of the last thing that we're trying to hold on to because we lost the whole thing of divorce. We lost the whole thing of remarriage. We lost the whole thing of definitely uh, churches outside Salvation Army that were against female leaders for many years. Now also you can have women bishops and things in many denominations. So there's so many battles that are lost that is almost like the church is holding on to this last thing. LGBT, we are definitely not allowed to lose that one as well. 
So it looks to me as we've lost the pioneering, the risk taking, we've lost the whole thing of simplicity. We end up doing more and more performance. I don't know about your worship service, but I've been to a lot, both in Salvation Army and other churches. And sometimes it's more about almost impressing others of how smooth things can be or how nice it can be or having the right brass band or worship band instead of the simplicity of worshiping God and really connecting with God. And just the last point is just kind of a, if you're taking in the bigger scene of things that we, as churches, we often get, get so much into want to be good friends with, with people in power. Just look at the Trump situation in the States where, you know, majority of white evangelicals were supporting Trump. And we see these pictures on Facebook where they came into his, the Oval Office and they prayed for this man, but they sold their soul because many of the policies were as anti-Christ as could be. But we are so desperate that people recognize us that we are happily selling off our souls to power. So who is truly empire and who is truly the kingdom of God? And one of my problems, for instance, is when I look at the mission state of the Salvation Army, and I'm sure many of you have had that discussion, but as a civilian and therefore an insider, but also an outsider, when I read that last sentence, I have huge, huge issues meet human needs in the name without discrimination. It means I, when I read that, I think that I'm as an out gay person would be fully included and affirmed. Well, I might be allowed to attend the night shelter as a trans person. I might be allowed to go to the, to the drop in, uh, the soup kitchen or something else. But actually as a soldier, as an officer, I stand no chance. So when people also said to me when I came to Denmark and got employed in Salvation Army, they said to me, I don't know, but why are you not an officer? And my answer was, I cannot promise you never to fall in love. I cannot make that promise. But if I fall in love, I will be a pastoral problem and you will throw me out. I've tried that once. I'm not going through that twice. And no matter how much I feel at home, I am not at home when I'm just tolerated. As one officer said to me, but of course, Arnold, you're welcome to come and worship here. Could you imagine saying that to all our female officers? Well, you're allowed to come and worship here, but you can't say anything. You can't do anything, you know, because you are a woman or me as a gay man. If I have a boyfriend or get married, then it is a total no-go. And more and more churches, evangelical, charismatic, Pentecostal churches, say they are including, but they are not. They might be welcoming as long as I come and just sit quietly and pay my 10% of my income. But do not kind of show off too much that you are gay. Do not come with your boyfriend. Do not do these other things because actually you're not truly included, you're just tolerated. If I said to my two children that I tolerate them, I don't think they'll come and visit me that much. They want to be loved, included, fully a part of the family, not pushed away in any way. So we have a lot of church spin going on for many churches at the moment, and it's very harmful for LGBT people because we are looking for places where it's safe to be and to tell our stories. If we just look at the bigger context, which is where I'm coming from and what I'm in presentation, this is from ILGA, where it looks at all the different nations of the world. And we often hear people saying, oh, stop flagging up all your sexuality, stop doing these things, you know, it is quite okay, what's your problem? I'd like to hear which other people group experience this level of discrimination in 43 countries in the world, there's no legal protection for people from the LGBT plus community. In 27 countries, you can get 10 years in prison for being LGBT. In six countries, you can face the death penalty. Tell me any other group that faces this kind of discrimination. So how come 
churches that it very much want to stand up for social justice do not see this as a problem. How come that this is not something that we must all be on the barricade saying, this is not right, that you are not allowed to be. For many years has been this almost cliche in English saying, I'm not a human doing, I'm a human being. But I'm not allowed to be in many of these countries. If I would go back to visit some of the ministries in India that I was involved in before, I could be in danger just for being me. So how come this is that we are not shouting about this? Or there was a big survey, I was part of a consultation, the European Commission, where they looked at how to push forward the agenda of LGBT for the next seven years. And one of the things that was really difficult for me was to see that the European Commission was more committed to LGBT inclusion than the churches. I come from a background where I read the Bible, we see that the kingdom of God is up against the empire because the empire is the one that oppresses, the empire is the one that discriminates, the empire is the one that, that destroys people's lives. But when I went to this, this consultation with the European Commission, it was not the empire that was doing that, it was the church. That was really difficult for me. But also just look at here, just in one of the many charts that's in this fantastic report, it's talking about politicians speaking out against LGBT. Some of the nations, it's 93%, 91%. You can see some of these countries, how it is that LGBT people are being used as the scapegoat. When you have to show what is to be a patriot, it's not to be LGBT because that is a bad thing. They are the pedophiles. They are the ones that are destroying family life. All these different things. We can see here how it is. The best country is the Netherlands and Denmark, Belgium, as you can see here at the bottom of it. So there are still big issues in society, even the European Union. But still, the commission said, we want equality. Or look at what LGBT people are facing in our communities. 67% was name calling, was a very of harassment. 68% ridiculing, you know. Some years ago, I went to a big LGBT conference in the States. We were 1400 people. And one night we had a Virgil where we were kind of just praying about people who have experienced violence or death because of being LGBT. For 20 minutes, people just shouted out names, one after the other, of people who've been beaten up or killed for being LGBT in the US. When I came back to say to the leadership team in the Danish territory, one of the officers said to me, that is all too tough, Arno. Why are you saying negative things like this? I'm saying it because it's the truth. It's our reality. Who wants to stand up for us? Then at this conference with the European Union, they kept on saying, the common enemy, the common enemy. And I thought, who are they talking about? Who is this common enemy? Until I realized that what they were talking about, no matter if it's NGOs or politicians or the commission, the common enemy was the church, the populists and the right-wing nationalists. How do you feel when you tonight hear that it was a common knowledge that the enemy of integration and inclusion was the church. And we are put just as much into the total far right extremists. That is the group that we belong to in their minds. Can, do you recognize that from your life? I was horrified when coming from the evangelical charismatic wing of the church to know that we are seen as the common enemy. But when I then see also some of these headlines, and I follow some of these headlines every day, what is going on, Franklin Graham, you know, the, the son of Billy Graham, again and again, we hear him talk about LGBT people being the enemies. You know, Christian children are not allowed to work with ch uh, Christian children of LGBT uh, parents because they are destroying their families. 
things like that. You cannot get hospital help or other help with, 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 with if you are LGBT. Things like this. When is the church going to speak truth to power instead of falling in love with power? One of my friends, Carol Shepherd, she's a leading expert uh, as a researcher about bisexuality, but she also wrote this book very recently. And um, she's trying to challenge us as a church, the church at last, large, and she's asking us, do we tr have blood on our hands? Because it's much more dangerous to be LGBT and of Christian faith than LGBT of no faith. Some research shows that it's you're three times more likely to commit suicide if you're a Christian LGBT than if you're not. More people, if you look at it, some of the statistics from England and the States, talk about that homeless people, about 30 to 40 percent are LGBT. If you then think about that, we are, we will always be a minority, two, three, four, five percent of the population, but 30, 40 percent of people suffering homelessness in some countries are LGBT, and many of them coming from Christian backgrounds. If, you, if the theology of the church puts people in the street, we have an issue. If the theology of the church, no matter how high view you have of the Bible, is part of destroying people's lives, there is an issue with our theology. Two illustrations from Poland. Again, to be a patriot in Poland, you cannot be LGBT. There are many, many local authorities that proclaim their LGBT free zones. So for instance, there was um, some people who have made the Madonna uh, Mary with a, a, a rainbow, as you can see at the top, and several people went to court and they could face up to two years in prison for hurting religious feelings. Just the other day, we heard that they didn't have to go to prison. But the gentleman at the bottom of, of the picture, he's also from Poland. He conducted a worship service, listen, a worship service at Pride. And because of that, he hurt religious feelings. And we still do not know if he will end up two years in prison for having a worship service. Shouldn't that make Salvation Army want to do worship services every single pride in Europe? Everywhere? You know, when I was trained in church planting, I always heard, and we were not Salvation Army, it was another group, we always heard Salvation Army will go and nobody else will go. So where is Salvation Army? Are they going all the different places? Do we dare to face the same as this man, possibly two years in prison for worshipping God? I think one of the problems in church is actually our Bible interpretation. I'll do this quick. I know my time is up. But often what I hear is that people just quote scripture at me. And they're very good at quoting that I'm an abomination. The problem is, if you don't understand what it means, it just means cultural, it means a cultural unacceptable. But people are sending me to hell with verses like that. And evangelical church is to stop just learning the Bible by heart and actually start to find out what does it mean. And Richard Raw has this beautiful thing of saying basic, basic faith is just quoting the Bible. Who is in and who is out, black and white, sinner, saint. But then we have the prophetic people, the prophetic books that start to challenge the status quo, speak truth to power. And that's also good. But we need to even get to wisdom where we dare to look at the paradoxes in the Bible, things that, that is difficult, verses that do not necessarily connect with each other. And I think before we get to that, we will not see inclusion in the church. And remember, we do not worship the Bible, we worship Jesus. And the Bible never says it's the word of God. Jesus is the word of God. I will not go into this one, but I just wanted to challenge you again, because the evangelical church would tell me that if I have sex with one man, I will go to hell. If I'm a practicing homosexual, I will go to hell. Because I'm an, I will then be an idol worshipper. 
And then I get challenged by people like Solomon. He's got three books in the Old Testament, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs. And it says in the first Corinthians, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God, neither the sexual immoral? But we read in first Kings that he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. We read that he was an idol worshiper. Are we saying Solomon is not saved? If not, why are we reading three of his books in the Bible? So when we so easily throw gay people, LGBT people to, to hell, it's because we do not have a consistent interpretation of the Bible. Can you follow me? One of the big challenges we have, I'm almost done, and this is um, Patrick Dixon who talks about the whole thing of, of the megatrends of this world. In one way, we like the uh, universal thing, the army. Everything's the army is the same in 130 countries in the world. McDonald's is the same in all the countries in the world. All this, we all want to speak English, all these different things. And therefore, again, of course, also like Salvation Army has an issue because we all, the, the decision about LGBT has to be the same all over the world. The problem is us who come from a minority group, we need our tribe. We need a place to belong. But I do not belong to Salvation Army when I'm not fully included. And the, also because people nowadays want something fast, they want change now. It means that we are so behind as a church, we cannot keep on using years and years to discuss these things because then we have too many of us have left the church and others who do not want to be in such a and a discriminatory church. We need to see change now. Can I challenge you with this, just from two different books? What I experience as a Christian and as a psychotherapist is that there's a, such a need for more authenticity. No more just image, no more just impressing others, just something very authentic. There's a book come out with full of pictures of men's love to each other for over a hundred years while it was uh, in these countries where the pictures are from was, was just, uh, was illegal. Or the other picture from the secret ward at the first HOE ward in England that nobody was allowed to know was there, where people were there together, loving each other, even they were dying. This love is what the church is telling me is wrong, that I cannot love, I can only lust. But we need a body that longs for authenticity and expression of true love. Can I just finish with this prayer? Christ be with me. Christ within me. Christ behind me. Christ before me. Christ beside me. Christ to win me. Christ to comfort and restore me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ in quiet, Christ in danger, Christ in hearts of all that love me, Christ in mouth of friend and stranger. May God bless our discussion. Amen. Well, thank you, Arno. Um, I don't know where to start <laughs> so much. Uh, all good, all good stuff, and so many of the the topics that you covered. Uh, I mean, they're sessions in and of themselves, just to jump and and drill down into. Uh, but we're going to have a little moment, an opportunity to maybe kind of dig a little bit deeper. Uh, we just encourage you, or you know, just to continue encouraging you to use the chat. And uh, someone on our panel is going to be feeding some of those questions to me. But just to kick us off, I know you dropped a bit of a bombshell. Uh, you, you said that, um, what did you say? You said Jesus is the word of God, not the Bible. Yes. Uh, what do you mean by that? Does that mean? Well, the Bible never states that it's the word of God. It's the word of man. It is inspired by God, it's breathed by God, but it is not God's word. And that is one of our problems, because if we see it as God's word, we easily become, become fundamentalists or literalists, and we just quote this verse at each other. And when we start to just quote verses at each other, we easily become Bible bashers, depending on which denominations we are from. And we try to win the battle of the Bible. 
but instead we need to actually find out what is the heart of God, what is is Jesus trying to tell us? For just think about it, Jesus is the face of God. And therefore, we need to, in whatever interpretation we come up with, we need to keep on saying, does this taste like Jesus? Does it feel like Jesus? Does it have the atmosphere of Jesus? If not, it is just not a God thing. And if you look at the Old Testament, there's so many misunderstandings and, and, and difficult things and that's one of the reasons why Jesus had to come, was to say, let's clear up this mess. You know, this is how to interpret it. This is how to do something. So what I'm just trying to say is that the Bible says that Jesus is the word of God. So let's try to get hold of the living word of God. That doesn't make interpretation easier, but it's much more fun and we will hurt fewer people. Oh, that's really good. And it's, it's good if we, yeah, to keep our answers short, because I've got the, the, I can see the chat is just going, going wild at the moment. So we're going to have a lot of questions. Um, but yeah, that's, that's really interesting. I've got a lot of questions, um, particularly about, I mean, you, the title of your talk was, where do we go from here? And you gave us a snapshot of some of the, the, the big challenges yes. that we face culturally, structurally. Um, and, you know, this context for this conversation, I'm not saying that everybody's part of the Salvation Army here, but most of us will be. Um, my, my first question to you would be, like many of our institutions and structures, for a whole host of re reasons, have not been great hmm. at um, mobilising this conversation so it reaches the, the margin, so it reaches everybody. Um, just, just from your perspective, uh, what, what sort of practices and behaviors um, do, we, do we need to be adopting in this moment? As we're not at the center, a lot of us, we're not, many of us are not, you know, driving the challenge from the center to some of these structural things. What would you say to us? What, what can we do? Uh, give us something. Well, I think, first of all, you need to be much bolder yet, because the problem is when we have a hierarchy that there's a number of denominations in the world that's very strongly hierarchical, it means that you also are told what to believe and what to think. And if you want a career within that movement, it's very difficult to speak up against people above you. And therefore also even people, also TCs that will be very inclusive, very often, well, I've not heard that many voices yet publicly say something. So we have an issue in people daring to speak out so I think that we need to keep on challenging people in leadership to actually dare to say something, but also as you started saying, we need to hear stories because without the stories, we have an issue. But also even for me as a civilian, I have a problem. I'm part of leading a human rights organization for LGBT, but I also have to be loyal to Salvation Army. So for instance, there was a podcast being made about my life and the first question was, you work for Salvation Army. They are not inclusive, are they? What shall I answer? Because if I answer tru truthfully, Salvation Army in Denmark could lose money because people will be horrified to find out that Salvation Army is not inclusive. So if I speak out, it could hurt our finances. At the same time, where, where nobody wants to listen to me to say, well, actually, there's an issue here. So what do you do? So I went around it saying, well, I'm a civilian, so it's Danish law, and therefore I don't have an issue. But that's actually not fair that I cannot, even as a civilian, really speak out and say there is a real issue here and people are getting hurt. So I think that, that we need to say more stories. We need to put more pressure on it. Uh, I think we need, it's good that also many things take it on YouTube, some of those stuff. I think we need to, to keep on pushing the agenda, also an open meeting saying, what are we going to do about this? Um, so I think there's an awful lot of pressure, but we just need to know that the world has moved on many places. Yeah. You know, in Denmark, we've had civil partnership for 31 years, and the church has not started to debate this yet. The movement is that things have to go fast, that's the mega trend. So do not think that we are going to discuss this for the next five years it'll create so much pain if it's five years or whatever. So yeah. I think we need to put it on the agenda and start to demand up in the system that things are going to be discussed. I've got a question just off the back of that then, Arno. Um, I was just reading a book recently by David Gushy, and oh. he talks about 
often we, we talk about traditionalists versus revisionists, but he also yeah. talks about, um, I don't want to label anybody, that's not what we're here to do, but avoiders. Um, and he, he, he says that uh, often avoiders with different levels of intensity, um, they, they avoid talking about it, um, often because their role is linked to, and their responsibility is linked to holding the institution together. And I know this sounds bad, but sometimes even they're holding their role, holding their job. Um, you know, what would you say to people who have perhaps got roles, they're, they're key leaders of influence, they, they have these conversations perhaps and these views personally. Mm. Um, what would you say to people who perhaps would fit into that category? And I, I do apologize yeah. for labeling people, yeah. but what would, you, what would you say to them? The thing is that, I, I, of course we need allies, but actually I suffer much more than the allies. The allies might have a bit of issues with the career, but they're still not being thrown out of, their, uh, of, of, of the church. I was thrown out of the church. Here, five years later, I'm still not in church leadership and ministry, even though it's my calling, because no evangelical church dares to touch me because I'm an out gay man. So I lost everything for being a gay man. Even an ally do not lose that much. So what I will say is that actually, if you believe in something, you need to stand up for it. You know, and no liberation has happened without sacrifice. And no matter if we look at Black Lives Matter in the States, black and white people were in danger. If you see the liberation of India, again, people's lives happen. You know, no women's voting. Today's the, the day of, of women's rights, isn't it? International Women's Rights Day. You know, we would never see any progress if people have not suffered. It's time to suffer for what you find is truthful for you. You know, and stand up for it but also be known for that you can be true to the Bible and stand up for the poor and stand up for LGBT and stand up for, for, for people who are suffering because of human trafficking, standing up for the Palestinians and other oppressed people. Why not get, become known as the people who actually are there to be trusted, where you can belong to, and therefore you know, here is a friend. Yes, it will be costly, but you will also win something else. And one of the things you will win is your integrity. That's good. Well, I'm, I'm just, I've got someone messaging me some of the questions from the, from the panel. So we'll hit some of those now uh, and do keep those questions coming. Um, so question for Arno, not sure who this is from. Uh, IHQ keeps repeating the message that we want to be inclusive, mm. but as we are an international movement, it is not safe, especially for some salvationists in Asia and Africa who face the death penalty. Mm. If we embrace full inclusion how do we help the salvation army to understand that our own lgbtq members are leaving the church leaving faith and sadly often leaving life because we are not included mm -hmm. uh, and this person has said so you might know who this is in brackets and i was privileged to join with arno at the conference in the usa <laughs> okay good yeah but see the the of course it's all the denominations where it's a worldwide scope, Anglicans, Catholic, the Orthodox, the United Methodists all have an issue because that everybody has to kind of abide by the same theology and structure. And I don't know if one of the things is to start loosening up that grip on the whole movement and start to stop trying to control things. At the same time, I've done lots of ministry in India and Sri Lanka. You know, there's lots of LGBT people, but where shall they go? You don't need to have a rainbow flag outside to say you are inclusive, but what are we doing in these places? Would Salvation Army then stop having women in leadership in all the different countries where they don't really like women in leadership? It's, a, it's, it's been a value since the beginning that, that women are there and you take that fight. So it's also dangerous for us, you know, even in Denmark, you know, but just in a different way, when church is not inclusive. And just look at, at things like conversion therapy, trying to pray the gay away, and all the things we hear in sermons. So there is an issue, but I think we need to go back to, to IHQ again and also be part of saying, now we actually want you to show up. We need also the inclusion officer to actually show up and have an open discussion or with the general or with others and saying, you need now to engage with this openly 
at least with the officers or within the, the, de the denomination, and start to say, let's put it on the table and saying, here we have issues with danger, here we have issues with finance, here we've got some other issues. Let's just be honest about the discussion. But starting the ethical discussion a few years ago, and definitely as part of my experience from here, is that it almost died out before it even got started. It's just not helpful. But as our TC told us at that time, we'll start a dialogue, but don't expect any change. Why would I want to be part of something where no change is allowed? That is not dialogue. Mm -hmm. When I dial when we two meet at a cafe, sometimes I am part of changing because I listen to you and you listen to me. And that's part of that dynamic thing of actually listening to each other. So you cannot have a dialogue when we already made a decision that no change is going to happen. That is not a dialogue. Yeah. Uh, I think just to add to that, you know, uh, you know, as we move, and our big hope, of course, is as we move and the pace increases towards inclusion, uh, we need to start as we, you know, we, we need to start as we need to go. We need to we need to start being inclusive in that process uh, if we want to get to to the, the the promised land. I don't know if that's the right term, but if we want to get to that place. Yeah. Uh, needs to be co-shaped. Um, I've got lots of questions here, Arno. So uh, some of them might be a little bit repetitive of things we've been talking about already, but um, someone's asking, how do we open this conversation with uh, the Salvation Army churches in places like, um, well, let's say Africa uh, yeah. and, and other places? It's not an issue. It's only an issue because we keep on thinking that people of color are evil. Because they do not, they're not as clever as us, they are not really understanding things, and therefore Africa will automatically, you know, be against us, Asia will automatically be against us, but actually they are not, they, are, they have an issue because that's what we've taught them, because again, we see a lot of Christians in the, in the States keep on pouring money into these countries to keep on telling them that, you know, we are ch child abusers and everything else. Many of these cultures have traditions of of, of same-sex relationships. Just look again at India that I know the best. You know, men relate in a very homoerotic way. You would, of, you would of course go hand in hand with another man down the street. You know, you would lie in each other's arms when you watch a film, you do that. So actually the whole way of relating is very different than it is in the West. So as we start, I have debated this with a lot of Asians and Africans. And when you start to say, let's hear the stories, Let's talk about it. Let's look at also some of the issues in your society, you know, and therefore actually see that actually we are people of faith. You know, I think that 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 is it's not an issue starting that debate, but we just need to start to tell stories. So it also means that us that are LGBT are allowed to tell our stories. So if I was going to talk to people from Nigeria that are typically are strongly against LGBT, um, just look at the Anglican church, well, I would like to tell my story because it's when I it's my story they have to then relate to. When then they hear that hear that again, I, I do healing meetings, I do other things as well, and I do prophecy and all this. Maybe I'm still a Christian, you know. And we need to see again that the caricature that's been that 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 that's been painted of us from the LGBT community is simply not true. So I think we just, it's not a matter of protecting them or something else, just get going, invite that debate and saying, let's sit down three or four people and do something, you know, and let's hear some stories. Let's hear some of the stories that are challenging in your country. Let's hear some of the challenging that's in here. But even just the thing about the injustice, is it okay for anybody in these countries to say that it's okay for Christian or for LGBT to be persecuted? Uh, the uh, um, so one church that I know of in London, they mainly can say, can, consist of refugees, Christian refugees from Uganda. Is it okay that people end up as refugees from Uganda because of the sexuality, Christian people being forced out of their country? Is that okay? If nothing else, let's start with a social justice issue of oppression and discrimination. Even before we get to it, are we okay about same-sex marriage and some of that? But can you... But in these countries, is it a price to encourage discrimination and oppression? Mm. Does that make sense? Absolutely, yeah. There's so much there. It's, uh, it's, it's great stuff. You know, when you were talking and, and uh, both now and in the content part, 
Uh, and I think you had a slide where it said the dark night of the church when the empire is more kingdom than the church. Yeah. All your headlines were like bombshells to me. Um, but there was, I mean, there was something where you 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 were talking about structurally, uh, uh, as, you know, within our organisations and institutions, they're not Christ-like, mm -hmm. they're, they're causing um, exclusion and all this. Yeah. What, what was the role of uh, repentance in this conversation? And yeah. what does that look like on an organisational level? Because sometimes we kind of think we can skip that, that we can, you know, strategize to a yep. better future or we can run ahead before we kind of do that metanoia repentance moment what does that look like and what could it look like the first thing is salvation army cannot repent from what they've done before they change their minds because you cannot repent as long as you keep on oppressing people and discriminating against people i will not get healed from what the church is doing before the church starts to change its mind so you know we can i can keep on forgiving but 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 we do not get to reconciliation before the oppression stops so that i do believe there is they're like the oasis church in in london they put adverts in the papers saying sorry for what we've done as churches against lgbt but at the moment salvation army cannot ask you know ask forgiveness as long as it still discriminates because it's still part of hurting people so we need to start a bit like the whole thing of, you know, to our own repentance, you know, and so God can heal the land, you know. So we need to start saying, well, actually, internally, is this acceptable? Are we going to repent, change our minds about these things so that we can ask for forgiveness and reconciliation to other people? I put an advert out recently of just on Facebook. Um, because I'm a body therapist and I wanted to especially do some trauma healing for LGBT community. Within 10 minutes, somebody has been in to look at my personal profile, see a work for Salvation Army, and they wrote, he's dangerous because he works for Salvation Army. So I had to quickly take this down about my clinic working to help people with trauma because working for Salvation Army would destroy my, my clinic before it even got started. So how do I also, you know, so for me as well, it is actually an issue for me to work as a civilian for Salvation Army because it stops me from reaching people I'd like to reach because Salvation Army is not just having a good word with everybody. Yes, some people will say Salvation Army, fantastic, wonderful brand, but there will also be groups that says, oh no, they're dangerous, they are hurting people. Mm -hmm. And that's my problem, the people I want to reach and see healing and wholeness they know the Group of Salvation Army is not kind to us. Well, we've got about five more minutes, Arno. Yeah. Uh, so if you can imagine an arc, if we can just edge towards, uh, you know, what, what, what signs of hope are you seeing? Yes. Uh, uh, what, what, what's your heart? What's your longing to see? Um, I'll ask you that in just a moment. So I'll give, I've already given you that one, but someone's uh, messaged, can you speak to us more? about how to call our church communities to recognize love mm. and not only lust in the LGBT uh, BQ community. Mm -hmm. God is love. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows, mm -hmm. knows God. Can you speak to us more about the role of the church, mm -hmm. local church in, in communities as a pastor? Yes, yes. The, the problem, of course, you have also, of course, I know your congregation, uh, Mark, you know, you can be welcoming, but you cannot be inclusive or affirming because your structures do not allow that. But at least you can be welcoming and you can try to do something there. I think we need to do something in our preaching. And that's also why I believe that one of the ways out of the dark night of the church is the whole thing of exploring what a more beautiful gospel looks like. You know, a gospel that again, look at the cross. You know, we don't, we, Jesus did not die on the cross because of an angry God. He died on the cross because of angry people. You know, God is love. Your uh, Chris also uh, did John 3 16, the whole thing that, that God sent Jesus into the world because of love. We are sent in to heal or be the healing voice to the community. And I think it's just as we've been used to often preach about taking care of people in the marchings and the poor and, and the homeless, we need to start just using other illustrations as well. 
start to also dare to say, you know, and the trans person that I met the other day, you know, I did this with, you know, so we start to become visible. And that we don't just use testimonies in church of see this um, LGBT person, they are faced, they're really, really struggling, but they've chose to live in celibacy and see how kind of heroes they are because they live celibate lives. That is not a hero. That is often a person that are of really much suffering and have deep, deep issues. So we need to find out which kind of stories are we celebrating. So I think in the local church, tell stories, show film clips, do things to do that. But also it's not just, promiscuity is not just for gay men. Just look at all the festivals, look at all the, the other things going on. You know, the straight community is, is just as good at this as we are. So maybe we need to stop painting caricatures, but actually start to show real people. So tell more stories, do something in the church, care for some people, invite dialogue, don't talk about people, talk with people. And you might not like everything they say, but listen to it anyway. And Arno, just before we, we kind of um, bring it to a close, yes. uh, you've got a, a special role, really. I mean, you, you sit on the, what is it, the European um, yeah, forum. Yeah. forum for LGBT Christian groups. What signs of hope are you seeing or good practice on our, in our, mm. I know this is a global uh, conversation today, but what signs of hope are you seeing on a, a European space? If I shall be really honest, I don't see a lot of hope right now. If I should be really honest, I think that the right wing populism has taken over so much. Look at Eastern Europe. Um, we look at the uh, in the US as well. So I think the problem is that at the moment, the swing is not for inclusion, it's against inclusion. Um, what I do see of signs of hope is, is groups like the United Methodists that at least are trying, daring, even saying if we need to split the denomination, which way can we do it in a healthy way? What can we do so we respect that there are different views here? Or can we find ways where we're saying, well, actually, it is up to each country or each congregation to do something so that we respect that it is different. In the Danish state church, it is not run by the bishops, really it's run by the government. But one of the things, they're forced to be inclusive. But for the evangelical pastors who are not, they can't refuse, for instance, to do a same-sex marriage, but they can say, I can't do it, but this person will do it for you instead. So you can pass the buck in a way, but as a denomination, they have still said inclusion is important. So I think we need to work with some of these models, or like the Baptist, where it's each congregation that makes a decision. But I think that we need to kind of loosen the structures and stop being so... Um, much like the old empire where it was Constantine that decided everything and all these kind of things, you know, and the church is taking over that control thing of society instead of allowing church to be a bit wilder, a bit more organic, and sometimes just really mess up, but at least we're trying to obey, to obey God and worship him. That's good. I quite like that bit at the end, for the church to be a bit more wilder. <laughs> Um, well, listen, um, we, we're going to we're going to honour the time, um, and uh, we're going to give people an opportunity to to jump off if they they need to go to bed or or do whatever or finish finish their day as well. Um, but for those of you who want to stick around, we're going to have an after I don't know what we're calling it an after chat chat. <laughs> and after Are we having an after meeting with the Holy Spirit coming here? Is that what we're doing about that? <laughs> Something like that. Something yes. like that. Um, so we, we just want to say to everybody, you're welcome uh, in just a moment to jump off. We're going to finish with a prayer and some announcements, but you're welcome to jump off then. But if you want to ask some more questions or, or dig a little bit deeper with Arno, we've got probably about another, uh, what have we got? There's another uh, 20 minutes of, of conversation 15 20 minutes of conversation um so firstly uh arno thank you so much for tonight thank you so much for sharing and in the midst of that we we caught quite a bit of content uh we've had our minds stretched and our, our thinking stretched uh but we've also experienced your heart and uh your passion and your longing uh for change and also your frustration 
Um, and uh, I just want to uh, acknowledge that. Um, uh, thank you for that gift uh, of, of joining us tonight. Um, some announcements for, for, for you all are that uh, if you haven't been, uh, we welcome you to visit the uh, uh, included page. There we go. That's good, isn't it? So there we go, www.includedpage.com. And on that page, you'll find some more resources, some videos uh, and some, uh, uh, yeah, just resources to help us further the conversation and, and to encourage you. We would also like to say to you that you can do that uh, and you can get some uh, conversations and, and up to date information on what we're doing on our social media stuff with Facebook. So we have a Facebook page as well. And we have an email, includedteam at gmail.com. And uh, we would love for you to reach out to us, whether you want to share your story, whether you have any further questions, whether you want to get involved in the movement. I don't know if we can call it a movement, but we long for it to be a movement. Uh, and we long for it to be a movement where no one is marginalized and everyone gets to play. Uh, so we welcome you to reach out to us and to talk to us for good ideas as well, suggestions on how we can uh, move this this uh, this conversation in a more dynamic and more impactful way. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, and so so do reach out to us. We do really, really appreciate that engagement with you. Uh, we'd love to be in a physical room with you. We know our worlds are very much online at the moment. Um, and we're thanking God that we have these possibilities and we're thanking God that we can join like this. I think we're, what are we, 90? We were 92, four people have already dropped off, uh, but we were 92 uh, at some point. So I, mean, I think that's just wonderful and that's that's great. Um, so before we go, I'm just gonna pray and join me uh, if you will. And then we'll have a pause and then we'll come back to, to have the after chat. So this is actually a benediction uh, written by Vicky Beechin, who some of you might know, and it's for inclusive worship. Words create worlds. God spoke in Genesis, his language distilling into stars, oceans, planets, and God still speaks today always innovating and constantly creative. He does not bend to cultural progress, rather he leads the way, not innovation for innovation's sake, but the plan of an upside down kingdom where the last are first and the dinner table is set for the unlikeliest of guests. His magnificence draws in the outsider and swings wide the doors for any and for all. Religious elites look on, shaking their heads at the lavish outpouring of outrageous grace. Words create worlds. God spoke in Genesis, his language distilling into stars, oceans, planets, and God still speaks today. At his voice echoes and new constellations dance into view. May we have minds that stretch wide enough to perceive the vastness of his imagination. And may we have ears to hear, unoffended by the greatness of his grace, even when its boundaries venture farther than our own. Amen. God bless you all. Stick around for those of you who want to. We'll see you soon.